I'm Amanda Mao from Accurate, together with my co-host Stephen Inglis and Blair Hasp. We say massive welcome to the Asia Pacific MacConf Network Cotley Zoom meeting. Welcome to non-APAC guests too, if we have any, and happy MacConf stay. We'd appreciate it if you could turn on your camera if you feel comfortable. In this one hour, roughly the first half hour is presentation Q&A, and the second half hour is networking. The recording will be for the presentation part and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. Networking will not be recorded. Now, I'll leave it to Blair to introduce today's guest speaker, Alice Wood. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, well, we're lucky enough today to have Alice from Wiley uh, join us, and she is the Associate Director of Open Access Business Development and, and Wiley, uh, who, at Wiley, who's uh, focused on delivering a sustainable transition to open access and leading Wiley's FLIP strategy, as well as the, the mon as monitoring the evolving open access landscape uh, around the world. So Alice is originally from the UK, uh, but is now currently based in Australia and works across the, the Asia-Pac region uh, to, to better understand the, the region's uh, characteristics and challenges when it comes to open access. Uh, she's been at Wiley for over a decade now and previously held a number of editorial roles, which gave her a, a really good grasp of uh, the challenges that the current environment for, prevent, uh, presents for publishers and learned societies uh, for, uh, who are publishing a lot in, in journals. So uh, I'm quite looking forward today to have a really good conversation with Alice and learn more about uh, transformational open access agreements in particular, which I think is something that maybe a lot of us have heard about but may not have encountered yet. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Alice uh, to uh, give her presentation. Um, and just for anybody who is interested in co collecting the CMPP credits uh, for this presentation, um, Alice is just going to sit on the slide for just a little bit so that you can grab a screenshot of it for your records in case uh, anybody at ISMAP uh, asks you to prove that you have a record of attending this event. And I think that's a, a great thing that we're going to be looking to do going forward with, with these events is to continue to, to get CMPP credits. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I think we may just about be the first people who've been able to do this outside of a formal ISMAP meeting uh, as part of, I know, ISMAP are keen to, to support uh, accreditation uh, within the Asia-Pac region. So uh, we're happy to be involved with that and to be providing a little bit of extra value for everybody here. So over to, over to you, Alice. Great. Thank you so much, Blair, and, and to all of you for inviting me along today. I'm really excited, particularly for the second half when I can have some discussions with um, with all of you and hear your perspectives on open access. And usually on this slide, I would introduce myself, but Blair's done that, so I won't go over that anymore. But just to say, yeah, I've been in, in Australia since October, so I'm still fairly new, um, but uh, getting used to the, the change in weather and the change in, la in lifestyle generally. Um, and yeah, learning lots about how open access differs in Asia Pacific compared to the rest of the world. And we'll talk about that. I've got a few slides on that um, a little bit later on. So hopefully you've all had time to screenshot that first slide and I'll move on to the learning objectives and agenda for um, what I'm hoping to cover in this first half of the session today. So I'm hoping to illustrate what open access is and the benefits that it brings, as well as the different options that researchers have um, in order to, to publish in open access. And as I just mentioned, how APAC has developed compared to the rest of the world. Secondly, to understand how transformational open access agreements are delivering increased open access. Um, and thirdly, to demonstrate how open research practices increase transparency and trust in the entire research process. So you can see the agenda on the screen here. I won't read through that because you can read and it, it hopefully will answer all of those learning objectives, but yeah. Um, we've got a section for Q&A at the end um, and I'll get going. So before we start, um, let's start with a definition of open access. I think hopefully most people here have heard of open access and have a general understanding um, of what it is. But I want to make sure we're all on the same page of all of the broad um, ramifications and, and benefits of open access. So really simply publishing open access means that research is available to everyone around the world to read and i think that's the part that a lot of people recognize as open access but importantly um, it's also available for people to build upon so the licenses that we publish under when we publish open access enable reuse uh, much greater sharing 
And when we get to the open research um, perspectives later on, you'll see the return on investment that, that happens with open access and, and the greater innovation that can happen as a result of those licenses. So much more about being free to read is great, but it's much more than that as well. And that's delivered in a few different ways. And those are typically designated different colors, which can be quite confusing if you um, hear about gold and green and diamond and platinum and all sorts of different types. The main two that I'm going to talk about um, on this slide are the, the, the main two ways that or the most prominent models, I guess, of open access. And those are gold and green. And for the rest of the presentation, I'll be talking about gold open access exclusively. But it's important to note that there are different ways of delivering open access. Um, through Gold OA, the article itself is immediately and freely available online for all to read, download, reuse and share, as I just mentioned. The um, public access is to the final published article, so the version that's on the publisher website is published openly under an open license. That access is immediate and permanent. That's often funded through an APC, and I say often here because it's not always the case, and increasingly we're seeing those APCs or article publication charges covered by institutions or funders, and we'll look at that with the transformational agreements a little bit later. They're published under Creative Commons licenses, which allow the authors to, first of all, retain the copyright of their article, which is different to um, traditional publishing models. But those Creative Commons licenses also allow for greater reuse and sharing and building upon. So to, to achieve gold open access, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. You can publish in a gold open access journal where all articles are open access within those journals, or you can publish in what's called a hybrid journal, which is a traditional subscription-based journal that offers open access at the article level. So within those hybrid journals, you'll see some articles are um, available if you have a subscription to that journal and some articles are published open access. Green open access, on the other hand, is where the author self archives a version of their subscription article, generally in an online repository or website. So there's free public access, access to a version of that article. Um, for example, the, the version that has been submitted to the journal can be posted immediately. Um, but if they want to post of the accepted version, so the version that has been through peer review and had any changes made to it, Typically, embargo periods then apply, so 12 months in most STM science journals, uh, sometimes 24 months in some of the humanities and social science journals. There's no fee payable by the author for green open access, but it does rely on the subscription model because that's the model under which um, the article is published in the journal itself. And the authors retain the right to use their articles for certain purposes, but it's not as broad as in gold open access under a CC license. So why do authors publish or why should we publish open access? There's benefits for authors and researchers. Um, many authors, particularly as open access was really gaining momentum, many authors were publishing open access because it was a condition of their funder or institution. Um, we'll see a little bit later the number of policies and how those have increased over the years. And that's resulted in an increase in the amount of content that's published OA. But there are other benefits to authors who choose to publish their work away too. Um, some of those benefits are listed here, greater visibility of the articles, um, which leads to a larger impact. And we'll look at some data on that from a study that Wiley conducted last year on the next slide. Greater retention of rights, as I mentioned, the CC, the Creative Commons license, um, allows the author to retain copyright and do more with their article. And it allows for compliance with mandates whether that be from funders or institutions. More broadly, for society um, and for innovation, open access brings more immediate access to the latest research. That itself um, and the licenses which allow reuse bring a greater return on investment in research, leads to accelerated innovation. We saw that during COVID with the development of COVID vaccines. A lot of um, that research was being published openly and the data itself was published openly too. Um, and that facilitates, as I said, the reuse and building on previous work. So we've known anecdotally for a long time, or we've suspected and heard anecdotally, that um, open access articles get greater visibility and impact. And we conducted a study actually a couple of years ago now. This is the third set of data that you're seeing here. So the third year that we've released our data on what the difference that we're seeing across um, around 400,000 articles that were published over a four year period in our journals. 
to look at the readership, the citation and the online attention that those received compared to articles that were published under the subscription model. And as you can see, these are the headline numbers across all of the Wiley journals. These vary by subject and by journal, but the headline numbers showed this year that on average, open access articles were viewed or read nearly four times more than subscription articles. Um, they're cited 1.6 times as often. So citations are really, really important metric for researchers to demonstrate their impact. And their alt metric score, which is um, a score that shows the online attention uh, through social media, news outlets, and also includes um, how much articles are being used in policy making. So that alt metric score tends to be four times higher for open access articles compared to subscription articles. There's clear advantages for authors when they choose to publish open access. But where did that all come from? It's undoubtedly the most prominent topic in scholarly communications today, and we're almost certainly nearing a tipping point where it becomes the most dominant model in some areas um, very soon. But it's not a new concept. And as you can see here, we're more than 20 years into this overnight revolution. Um, and 20 years into the real push for open access to scientific literature. I'm not going to go through all the detail on these slides, um, but I wanted to get across here that the debate and the behaviours of key stakeholders evolved over this period. So back in the early 2000s, we saw the first major initiatives and letters signed. We saw publishers start to experiment with open access models, particularly that hybrid model that I mentioned right at the start, where um, some articles can be made open access within journals that was introduced um, in 2005, 2006 by most publishers. Um, we then saw open access starting to go more mainstream and governments turning their focus to publishing. But what we saw was that um, the pace of change was pretty slow. Despite all of these things that were happening, the amount of content that was being published open access was still low and many were understandably frustrated. So from 2017, 2018, we start to see the pace increase. We see the first transformational or transitional deals agreed. Um, we see more and more governments and funders introducing mandates for publishing open access. Um, and particularly in, in Europe, we saw um, Coalition S, who started with primarily European funders, um, start to push for a move even away from hybrid journals towards fully gold in order to accelerate the transition to gold open access. That landscape that I've just described is grounded in those shared declarations that we saw in the early 2000s. It's supported by policy changes, policymakers, funders and institutions. There's now actually more than 1100 policies posted um, on raw map, which I'm gonna show on the next slide. Um, that makes it a complex landscape too. Uh, sometimes funders and, and institutions will have um, conflicting policies. So for researchers, we know it's a very complex landscape to keep up with, um, but it is um, a landscape where open access itself is making headlines and has increased visibility, both in the scientific press, but also the mainstream press. Um, and finally, researchers are increasingly demanding publishing that's faster, easier, and more open. Those policies that I just mentioned, Raw Map is a place where you can go and see the policies by country, by institution, by research funder, um, saw a huge increase over the last 20 years. Um, there's more than 1100 policies worldwide, but interestingly, I thought only 84 of these are in Asia and 42 in Australia and New Zealand. So we're seeing quite different levels of policy setting around open access uh, by region. Another way that we can see the growth of open access is the number of open access journals, fully open journals, where all articles are published openly. And the Directory of Open Access Journals is a database that was launched in 2003, and it launched with 300 journals. And now it has more than 18,000 peer reviewed OA journals that cover all areas um, from all countries and in all languages that are accepted for indexing. So of those 18,000, three and a half thousand based here in APEC, um, but 2,000 of those in Indonesia alone. So Indonesia has a long history of local open access journals, and we'll see the impact of that in a few slides on the proportion of their content that's published openly, um, which is one of the highest in the world as a result of their own local publishing landscape. 
open access to research articles is in the news now more than ever. Um, the global pandemic highlighted the importance of access to scientific research and publication under appropriate licenses. And more recent media that I've shown here has focused on the large scale, often national pushes for greater access to research. The, um, I wanted to talk a bit more specifically about Asia Pacific and the development of open access here. So the first slide that I've got here is some findings from the Core Asia report, which came out in 2017. So it's a little bit um, old now, but I think it's quite interesting to see here how we've um, adapted, adopted open access compared to maybe North America and Northern Europe in particular, where we saw probably a lot of the early activity around open access. So the core report looked at um, open access within Asia and uh, found that all regions involved in the survey were adopting an open access model, but that there was a gap in the funding to support both the infrastructure and the implementation of policies. It found that governments typically um, approved of the open access movement, but only half of the regions reported that there were funding agency or institutional policies in place. So that that. Um, reflects what we saw on the previous slide with the number of policies here in Asia um, or Asia Pacific. Only nine regions, there were 16 regions, I should say, were um, covered in the report. Only nine of those reported the presence of a centralized support for open access policies. And the funds that were directed towards open access were majorly used for national repositories. Um, so pushing more towards that green open access model that I mentioned earlier on. In terms of policies, we see some movements um, in some areas in Asia Pacific. So in Australia, the NHMRC released their new policy last September, which aligned with the Plan S principles. So Plan S, I mentioned very briefly before, um, is, part of is a plan released by Coalition S, a coalition of funders primarily based in Europe, who are looking to accelerate the move to full open access. Um, I won't go into lots of detail about that here, but it's just... Um, interesting to note, we've had one funder here move to align with those principles. We're also expecting an open access strategy for Australia to be developed. Um, I think that's on hold at the moment um, with the chief scientist, but we're, we're eagerly awaiting details of what that might look like. In China, there's no national policy, but many of the policies that we see encourage green open access. But what we see in practice is that authors will pay to publish in high impact journals. So China is one of our biggest or our biggest output um, in our open access journals. It's the biggest area for growth within our fully open access journals. Um, and that's why we watch very carefully when there are policy changes in China. For example, the Ministry of Science and Technology introduced their new policy in 2020 which encourage researchers to publish in domestic journals and in high quality international journals. In India, a um, huge amount of research comes out of India, uh, but mostly those are published in subscri behind the subscription or in the subscription model behind a paywall. Um, there's a great level of concern in India about the reputation of open access and fears over predatory open access, so journals that publish an article, take a fee, but don't carry out proper peer review, for example. Um, and in Japan, we've seen changes to the OA policies um, last year, and we're expecting a greater push towards gold open access in Japan. Um, it's just been announced at the G7 summit a couple of weeks ago. Um, so things are changing and we have some transformational agreements. I'm not going to talk about that here because I've got much more detail on that in a couple of later slides. So I made this chart actually at the end of last year, um, looking at some of the countries and regions within Asia Pacific and how much of their content is being published openly. Um, this is across all publishers. I took this from Dimensions, which is a database that um, includes a great number of journals. And as you can see, the top country is Indonesia. Um, and much of that is driven by that local open access publishing that I mentioned earlier. But what you can generally see is an increase in all countries in the proportion of their content that's being published openly. And we'll start to see this increase even more for some of those regions through transformational agreements. To turn to Wiley quickly, um, we have been leading the transition to open access for over a decade. 
we launched our first two gold journals in 2011, which is coincidentally also the year I joined Wiley. Um, and it's safe to say a lot has changed since then. So from our first two journals in 2011, we now have more than 560 open access journals. So journals where all the articles are published open. We also have a further 1300 hybrid journals where authors can select open access for their article. We started flipping journals. I think Blair mentioned in my bio at the beginning that one of my jobs is to lead the flip strategy for Wiley. And that's where we change a journal from a subscription or hybrid model to a fully open access model. We're doing more and more of those each year as we move towards a fully open access future. We've got a number of transformational agreements that I'm going to talk about. We have acquired Hindawi, which was the second largest pure open access publisher that helped us to get to that 560 plus open access journals that we have today. Um, and they have um, even better reach than we have in, in some key regions such as China. Um, so we, our approach to open access has changed a lot over the last 12 years. Um, and we are fully committed to an open access future. The way that we deliver that is a number of different initiatives. So we launch new open access journals where there's a gap in the market. Um, we launch those both um, at Wiley and with our partners that we publish with. So in China, we're launching a large number of journals in partnership with Chinese institutions. And all of those have been open access in the last few years. We're flipping or transitioning journals to open access where there's evidence of support for OA within that particular field and it's sustainable to do so. Um, we evaluate all of our journals every year to determine which journals are ready to move to OA. Transformational agreements, which is most of what I'll talk about on the next three slides, are agreements that allow researchers to publish their work open access at no direct cost to themselves. If you remember back on that first slide where I showed gold versus green, Gold open access typically um, is delivered through an article publication charge. The transformational agreements take that burden away from authors and enable institutions and consortia to transition their spend from subscription. So we look at what they've been spending on subscriptions and spending on open access, and we transition that money um, from, from subscription to open access in a sustainable way while still giving them access to all the literature that is available that still requires a read license. So you might hear them called transitional, transformational. I think I've used both of those phrases already today. They're also often referred to as read and publish agreements because they deliver both sides of that coin. So they give access to those institutions to all of the subscription content that we publish and they allow all of the researchers that are affiliated to those institutions to publish open access in our hybrid journals and in our gold open access journals. This map shows um, two different things. So the pink, or the kind of light pink, I guess, um, shows the transitional agreement, transformational agreements that we have in place. Those, like the open access movement itself, really started in Europe four or five, six years ago, um, but have expanded much more globally in recent years. Um, it also shows open access coverage that we deliver for the developing world through the Research for Life initiative. The Research for Life initially um, and still provides read access to low income, low and middle income countries. Um, but in open access journals, it also offers waivers or discounts to authors in those countries. So we're starting to color in more and more countries on this map as we either um, offer coverage through Research for Life or as we sign more transformational agreements. So those agreements that take the um, subscription access and the publishing and add those together for those authors. Let's look at Asia Pacific in a bit more detail. Um, we've got a number of agreements here and we're adding more um, all the time. They are um, changing too. So we've had a couple of these agreements in place for a couple of years and they're expanding as we increase the amount of open access. So the agreement that we have with Call here in Australia and New Zealand, um, previously last year, the first year of the agreement covered just hybrid journals but was so successful and was there's so much demand for that that, um, that now also covers publishing in our gold journals. Another really good example of expanding our agreements is in Japan, where we started last year with four institutions who signed up to the agreement. Um, again, they saw the impact that that was having or other institutions saw the impact that was having 
and 14 more joined that agreement in this year in the second year of the agreement. So all authors based at these or affiliated to these eligible institutions are able to read all of the Wiley content and also to publish in, in Asia Pacific in all of our hybrid gold and Hindawi journals. The impact of that is that in 2022, 36% of our articles were published open access and 19% were funded through a transitional agreement. Um, that was compared to 16% in 2019 where just 3% were published within FDA. I'm really looking forward to seeing the 2023 numbers because it will be even higher. We've signed a huge number of transformational agreements this year. Um, and what you can see hopefully in the bar chart, I think we're sharing the slides possibly afterwards if people need to look at this in more detail. Um, what you can see is that those transformational agreements are delivering particularly in hybrid. Um, in hybrid open access, we saw 41,000 articles published last year under a transformational agreement compared to 26,000 the year before. All the while, that bottom bar chart shows you that we're still publishing a significant number of articles under the subscription model. So the read side is still really important for all of our customers. Um, and we'll continue to see those numbers shift as we make more agreements and as more researchers choose to publish their articles open access. I've got three more slides, I think, because I wanted to look at open research practices more broadly. So we've spent a lot of time today looking at open access, so access to the research article itself. But open research describes open um, opening up the whole research process and cycle. So we can open up our data, which maximizes the value of research, um, adds to an increased return on investment by reusing data that's available rather than having to start from scratch. But this open data and open practices also add a greater level of transparency to all parts of the process. And that transparency helps us to increase trust in research publishing. It also interestingly makes it easier to identify and investigate potential misconduct. So there was a researcher in the US uh, probably about three years ago now, some of his co-authors raised some serious concerns about some of the, ac the accuracy or fabricated results in his articles. And most of the articles that he had published were published in journals that mandated data sharing. So the data that was behind his articles had been shared and that actually made the subsequent investigation much more straightforward for those journals because they were able to go into his data and find and prove um, inconsistencies and fabricated results. So, really great for society in terms of maximizing the value of research but enabling us to have greater trust and transparency is also a really important part of the puzzle and i've got an example here of an article from the journal sociology of health and illness that um, has adopted a number of open practices uh, this is a hybrid journal which allows open access publishing and as you can see this is an open access article so it's got this unpadlock open padlock and purple text here it's published under a Creative Commons license, which is what the little icons are referring to. Um, it was funded by the NHMRC and the open access fee was covered by the Australian Transformational Agreement. So that allows all authors at UQ, this university, to publish um, open. The author has provided an ORCID identifier here. This is a um, ID number that you can sign up for that allows you to differentiate yourself from other researchers with the same name. It brings together um, all of your research outputs in one place. And many journals will now ask authors to have an ORCID in order to submit their article. This journal has also adopted credit, which helps to flag the contributions that each author has made. So you'll see that the corresponding author here was also the lead for the conceptualization of the article and that they were supported on that by the two other authors. The third author took the lead on methodology and project administration. Um, so there's the different roles that you play and whether you've been lead or supporting in that. So some journals have adopted this in order to better describe author contributions. Last but not least, this journal uses um, an expect data sharing policy that um, I've kind of talked about data sharing. Different journals will have different policies on whether you have to do it or not. In this case, um, that involves including a data availability statement on, in your article that shows um, if and where data is available. 
In this case, the data availability statement actually shows that the research data isn't shared. So in this case, they've given privacy and ethical restrictions that stop them from sharing the data. In many cases, you'll see that you can request the data from the author directly, or this statement will include a link to a data repository where you can find the data. There's a couple of other research practices here. I couldn't find one article that had done all of them, so I had to include these two on a separate slide. Um, but we've got open research badges that some of our journals use, particularly around pre-registering studies. Um, and some of our journals are now also employing transparent peer review. So the peer review comments um, and the responses that the authors have made are available alongside the articles in order to show the whole process that that journal has been through. Okay, that's what, that was my last slide. I feel like I've rushed through those and maybe spent quite a bit of time on them, but I think uh, we've got a bit of time for Q&A before we break out into breakout rooms. Is that right, Blair? Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks, Alice. That's uh, really interesting. And, and just a reminder for, for everybody, please hang around uh, to the end of the Q&A so that we can get a screenshot of everybody who's been here. Um, and I've got a, a question that I might kick things off with is obviously a lot of the people on the call today uh, work with probably often with pharma companies. Mm. So in terms of these these open access transformational agreements and things like that, if, if we're collaborating with, say, a doctor who's involved with a public institution uh, who are a participant in one of these agreements, do they have access to that, that open access funding? Um, or like the, those agreements, even though the work has been funded by a, a private enterprise? Yes. Yeah, so the... Well, the it depends, but generally, yes, they have access to them if they are affiliated to one of the institutions. So they need an official affiliation, and we see that um, very commonly that doctors will have an affiliation with the university as well as their, their kind of day job. Um, if they are the corresponding author, so all of these transformational re agreements require the author who is affiliated with them to also be the corresponding author on the articles. So that's a key thing that I didn't mention mm -hmm. in my slides before. Mm -hmm. But say you're working with a doctor who also has an affiliation with the University of Melbourne, they would be able to access the call agreement that we have with Wiley in order to be funded for open access, provided that they're the corresponding author. Okay, that, that, that's very interesting, because uh, I guess it's kind of, yeah, I guess when, <laughs> I'm sure there will be plenty of plenty of funders out there who aren't necessarily uh, if we, if, you know, private funders, we, we should say, rather than, than public funding agencies who might be very interested to know that, that, that they might be able to take advantage of, of those sorts of uh, agreements. Um, does anybody else have any, any particular questions that they'd, they'd like to ask Alice? Maybe I would just have a comment, Alice. Thank you. And this is actually the first time I've heard about the transformational agreements. And, and I think it's 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 really uh, opening my eyes and especially I'm, I'm thinking uh once we had a chinese author uh doing this uh the um the hybrid journal so they can choose whether you want to choose mm. access or not and then right away they chose not open access although we already ed educated them like you know uh open access will increase this and that but then the cost is pretty high so just now I listened to uh, with interest that transformational agreements, it will ease the author's burden. So I, I really applaud for that uh, advancement. Yeah, it's been a huge driver for it. We were growing really well in open access, both in hybrid and open access before the transformational agreements, particularly where funders were mandating open access. And some of those funders also provided funds for authors, uh, but the transformational agreements have definitely accelerated for us. That, that open access uptake. And you're right, in China, we tend to see limited uptake in our hybrid journals. But as I mentioned before, China's the biggest country for us in terms of open access output in our gold journals. So there's different behaviors that we see with authors in different regions too. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, uh, would you like to stop sharing? So oh, maybe we'll, yes. yeah. Sorry, I've got two screens, so I can see all of you. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that um, we've had a couple of uh, instances already where we've had institutions pick up the open access fees for pharma-sponsored um, articles, at least for the medical writing. So, and that's only really happened recently. So it's kind of almost come as a surprise to us because typically we go through the process of, you know, maybe paying those fees on behalf of, and we, we never receive that email and we find out after inquiring that they've actually already been picked up by the corresponding authors institutions. So it is definitely starting to happen in a practical sense. 
it's, it's an automated process too, to a large extent within our system. So when an author's article is accepted and the corresponding author goes into their, they, they'll have an email that says your article has been accepted. Please go to author services, which is our system that we use to manage copyright and payments and, and all of that kind of post acceptance stuff. When the author goes there, if the system recognizes that they're from an institution, if they've used, so they need to use that affiliation when they submit the article. We need to make sure it's really clear that they're affiliated with um, whichever university it is. The system then will recognize that and will um, flag to them that they may be eligible for that transformational agreement funding. Often we find authors don't even realize that they've got that option available to them. So mm -hmm. the system flags that to them and brings that up as the first, the kind of default action to use that funding. Um, yeah, it's great to have that context now because um, it was kind of something that was occurring a bit more frequently. Um, just if I can segue into another question, um, in terms of the open data sharing, obviously, um, in addition to the ethical kind of example you gave in terms of patient privacy, I mean, a lot of the time, pharma data, uh, uh, they're not readily um, wanting to share data for kind of intellectual property purposes. Um, uh, and of course, there are statements for that as well. I mean, do you think there's any risk because you mentioned the idea of data sharing kind of almost um, having an implication that if you don't share it, then maybe you kind of um, you can't be kind of uh, checked for whether or not the data are, are, are kind of validated as with that author. Is there a chance that that kind of could leak over into an interpretation that if a pharma company doesn't publish for IP reasons that they might be trying to hide something or... That's interesting. I've not thought of it from that perspective before. I guess it's possible. Um, at the moment, we see a real mix of who shares their data and who doesn't. So most journals will have the policy that I that 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 journal that I showed you have, where you need to have the statement that shows where you're sharing it or if you're sharing it. Um, mm -hmm. Our one of the phrases I've heard when you talk about open data, um, which I really like, is that open data should be or data should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So sometimes that means that some parts of the data can be made openly available, even if not all of it can. And I think as long as we're describing really clearly the reasons behind data being open or not, um, then, then that's answering part of the transparency question, even if the data itself isn't available. So I, don't, I personally would encourage as much data to be made available. And when we talk about data here, we're really using that as a very broad definition for really anything that went into that making that research article um not just sort of traditional data set um but yeah i think that's an interesting perspective i haven't thought of that before the kind of implicit <laughs> well, that, well, your response makes sense um so yeah. thank you and, and nice presentation by the way and it will thank you it will depend on the journal too so it's an important thing to just be aware of when you're submitting to journals if you do have restrictions on what data can be shared there are some journals that have a stronger data policy, so they will mandate data sharing, um, and they will have some exceptions in place. For example, um, much of early data sharing within ecology and evolutionary biology, so I know more on that side than on the health side, we have exceptions there around endangered species, for example, where we wouldn't want to be publishing data that would allow people to find where the endangered species are living. Um, so there are, there are kind of defined exceptions, and it would just be worth making sure when that research is being submitted that that journal will that policy will align with with what you're planning to do with the research data yeah good advice thank you anybody any other questions that we can anybody has before we probably move into the breakout sessions I, I, well, I we can one. shout oh, out sorry. for Malcolm Sky. Yeah, the, the, the last one. How about the last one? And then we can uh, shout out for Voto. And then in the breakout rooms, we can have more detailed discussion with Alice and Simon. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. I, I do. Uh, this is the transformation agreement. Again, that, this is quite new to me as well. And that, that's very interesting. Very interesting to hear that mm -hmm. authors of uh, or, um, corresponding authors who are institutions where the transformational agreement is in place uh, can access that that funding. Um, would there be any issue in that public institution providing the open access funding for a private, privately funded work? So would there need to be an agreement in place between the author's institution and the study sponsor if the, the study sponsor was 
providing the funding for that work? Yeah, it's not something that's come up a huge amount yet, to my knowledge. Um, so it might be a, an answer that evolves. But if the author is listing themselves in the research article as being affiliated to that institution, typically that's why the institutions are happy to cover the fee, because they're getting that kind of recognition and authorship. Um, so it's not really tied at the moment that funding isn't tied to who has funded the research. It's it's transition because it's transitioning the money that those affiliation um, sorry institutions are spending on subscriptions at the moment it's really just moving them towards their open access goals for their authors and it's we don't at the moment we list the funders but it doesn't mean just because you're funded by this funder you do or don't get funding from the institution at this point so at the moment the criteria that most institutions are using is is this author affiliated with my institution yes then i'll approve the funding request so i'm not aware of um there being that direct link at the moment between different funding models but it's not something I've come across yet so I might have to come back if there's a different answer to that evolving as if we get you know a huge increase in the number of farmer sponsored articles being published through those institutions the, the agreements do have caps there's a limited number of articles that the institutions can publish each year um, typically it's set at a level where we don't expect to exceed it if we got to a point where an institution was exceeding their cap every year, they might look more closely at which articles they were choosing to fund. I, I have you. a question. May I? Uh, hi. Yeah, yeah go, I'm Mary go ahead, Mary. Shikawa in Japan. And I'm just wondering, so an, an institution can have a subscription model for some journals and then an, uh, this transformational agreement with other journals or it's it's all Wiley journals. So in Japan, we have a mix. We have 18 institutions that are part of our transformational agreement. So those institutions get access to all of, read access to all of our journals and they can publish in all of our journals. Um, there are then other institutions in Japan who aren't ready for that kind of agreement. So they would have a different type of agreement with us, typically a subscription or a license agreement where they will subscribe to a a set of journals over a period of time. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Just um, related to that question, probably, um, the transformational agreement that you talk about and perhaps you covered this off, is that specific to Wiley or are other publishers doing their own similar thing called something different? Um, they're all, yeah, they're all, well, I was going to say they're all called transformational agreements. We all use slightly different names for them. So you have transformational, transitional, um, transformative agreements read and publish, publish and read. I can't remember the other names, but all, many publishers are doing those. So it's not unique to Wiley. Um, each agreement will be between a publisher and an institution. Um, so Wiley has 79 agreements in place um, covering tens of thousands of institutions now, um, but other publishers are doing similar things. So here in Australia and New Zealand, um, Call has, has negotiated agreements actually with a a large number of publishers so now most articles that Australian and New Zealand researchers would be published most journals that they'd be publishing in are probably covered by transformational agreements in Japan I think we're the only major publisher that's got one of those at the moment so it varies at the country level um, there is a registry of open access agreements which is called ESAC e -A -C, um, which is a European I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for now but they um, provide a summary of all of the agreements that different publishers have with different institutions. And you'll see those are wide ranging and ours are wide ranging where some of them cover one institution um, of, and maybe like 50 or 60 articles a year up to our agreement in Germany that covers nine and a half thousand articles a year in 800 institutions. So that one's really a national deal. Some of them are more institutionally based. Thank you. So uh, how about we wave, you know, today is the Macom Day. How about everyone wave and then we say Macomb Day and then we can go into breakout rooms. <laughs> okay, happy okay, Macomb Day. Day. <laughs> Ma happy Macomb Day. Day.